Hello and welcome to video lecture two. This video lecture will be the introduction uh, formally to module one, the forms of writing assignment slash discourse community analysis and genre analysis. Um, I know that those three terms are not identical, mm -hmm. but they are all related. And what I hope you see over the course of this lecture is the relationship between those terms and, um, well, in part why I kind of use them interchangeably, but more importantly, the idea is to understand the theory behind the practice so that when you go to do this work, you're able to do it. Um, so this lecture is going to cover uh, a few things. First, I'm going to provide an update on course materials, uh, specifically the peer review and what's available to you to complete your Module 1 assignment. I'm then going to move on and offer a uh, abbreviated reading of the Pogner Discourse Communities and Communities of Practice Working Paper. Um, I'm going to focus on the most important parts of that and kind of take you through how I see it being useful. Then I'll get to the assignment, which hopefully will make a little more sense to you uh, after you've read Pogner. Uh, and then we'll conclude with just a couple of comments on the logistics for completing this project, particularly as it relates to the writing process and the series of assignments that you have coming over the next several days. So. Let's start with an update on course materials. Uh, I've posted the peer review guidelines uh, this morning. Uh, I have not yet sent out partners. Uh, I'll send that out uh, later today or tomorrow. It's really not important yet. Um, but if you take a look at the peer review guidelines, what you'll see is that uh, for this section, well, for all of my online sections, but also for most of my in-person classes, I use a peer review letter for a peer review. Now, peer review is something that I think most of you have experience with some way, shape, or form. Um, I think a lot of us, uh, if you went to high school in the United States, you at some point most likely had an English class where you swapped papers with a neighbor and you would look for proofread essentially for comma use errors or things like that. Um, if you have had that experience, what we're going to do now will be somewhat familiar. Uh, if you have not had that experience, the kind of theory behind peer review is that it allows you to become the best reader and evaluator of your own work and it puts you in a position of responsibility to take ownership of that project and of the quality of it. Um, and by using peers as a sounding board, it offers you all a chance to kind of work out your own expectations for your own work, what you think uh, is acceptable, what isn't. And of course, I'll be there to provide guidance um, from the top. But with the peer review format, it really puts you in a position to understand how to improve your own writing and it puts you through that process in a kind of guided way. Um, you might think of the prompts almost as like training wheels and then by the end of the course you can take those training wheels off and make those decisions for yourself. So it's about showing you how to find room for improvement in your own work and how to develop strategies for doing it, um, as opposed to me just giving you like a paint by numbers, fix A, B, and C, where you haven't really learned anything, you've just followed orders, and that doesn't really help anybody. So that's the kind of uh, philosophical, if you will, uh, support behind peer review, and uh, as a professional and scholarly practice, uh, peer review serves another function, which is quality control. Um, namely, when we're dealing with knowledge production, which is what we do in scholarly work, something that Pogner talks about, um, peer review is quality control. So, for instance, I wrote my dissertation on... On, what the heck did I write on? I wrote on early American literature, so specifically literature uh, in the United States produced between roughly 1750 and 1840, uh, and I looked particularly at theories of class and the role of economy in shaping uh, some of the narratives that emerged during that time. So based on that, I might write uh, a scholarly article arguing, say, that Rip Van Winkle um, story from the short story from the 18 early 1820s um 
is actually a narrative of the decline of the kind of rural agrarian, uh, early American class and the kind of rise of a more worldly, um, worldly capitalist uh, system uh, after the revolution. So I might write that scholarly paper and I would then submit it to an academic publication for review. What would happen then is the editor of a scholarly journal, say American Literary History, would say, okay, this is a paper on class and economy in uh, the 1820s. What other experts are knowledgeable about these matters? And then they would take copies of my submission, send it out to my peers my other experts who know a lot about this and they would say, hey, read this over, offer a review for the writer and say yes or no, should we publish it? Um, and of course, if it's accepted for publication, it means that it's approved. So in the future, future scholars might cite that article that I submitted or more likely um, the, the reviewers will say, Maybe we'll publish it, but we need to see certain revisions first and offer me significant guidelines for revision, and then I can resubmit it once I've made those corrections. Um, but it's a process that ensures what gets to count as knowledge, because if you think about citation, work cited, um, when you cite something in a paper, it means that uh, it's true. It means that it's verifiable. It means that it's accurate. It's honest. It's authentic. It means all of those things. And so the moment uh, an academic or scholarly text is published, it takes on a real kind of significance that it doesn't have if it just exists in a vacuum. So peer review in a scholarly or professional setting is, is that, really. Um, there's no more teacher. It's just peers. Um, so we have to decide what counts. And that's where this model kind of goes to, ultimately, um, when I have you writing a peer review letter in here, obviously the stakes are a little bit lower uh, for you all personally, uh, but they're all, it's on, and it's a, certainly it's a more manageable assignment than peer reviewing like a scholarly article. But it's the same idea of a letter format being the principal genre that you're using to offer a qualitative assessment of scholarly work. So, that letter format is really important because it's where you see scholarly work. Um, it's no longer like a writing assignment for a class that you produce in a vacuum. All of a sudden, when you write a letter, there's an audience, there's a reader, and there's a sender. And those people have roles within uh, the field of knowledge production that they're involved with, or in your case, in this class, in our class. So you have to consider what's useful to them as a peer. Um, and because it's a letter feedback, it also allows for um, addressing what's called both global and local feedback. So global feedback might be a question like, does this assignment respond to the writing prompt? And you would offer an evaluation based on your complete completed reading of the text. Yes, here's why. No, here's why not. More likely a yes in some ways, no, not in others. And here's my evidence. Um, but it also does allow for some local feedback where you might say third paragraph, fourth sentence uh, is overly wordy and passive voice, and I can't tell why it fits into the paragraph. So the letter genre of peer review allows for both local and global feedback, whereas the kind of peer review you might be used to, peer editing, where you swap papers and like make grammatical corrections, that really only allows for local feedback, where you're looking at sentence level and stuff, maybe paragraph level. So the letter format both models a professional and scholarly practice, and it also allows for a greater range of response, which is why I use it. Um, in terms then of the type of feedback that you're going to be providing, um, I'm looking at the peer review guidelines right now. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is that uh, I give you a pretty firm outline for the structure of the letter. I go paragraph by paragraph with different questions to address. Um, you don't necessarily have to respond to every single one of those questions. One of your jobs as a peer reviewer is to say what's most important to improving this draft what maybe is not worth this person's time um, because we all have different strengths as a writer and sometimes it's kind of worth it to develop the strengths more than to you know boost the weaknesses but 
in general, you want to kind of respond to as many of those questions as you can in each paragraph, and you want to do it in a way that restates it to offer your evaluation of the material. So we want to kind of take command of these questions and speak to the writer using their own terms. Um, to that end, I included an instruction in the peer review guidelines where I ask you to review the handout titled Quotation Integration Handout. Now, this is a handout that, um, well, its primary function is uh, quotation integration, and I think that's something that we could all use a refresher on in our writing. So don't be shy about reviewing that part of the handout, which is page one, of course. Um, but what I really like about it, too, is on the second side of the handout, page two of two, it offers you a three-step quotation integration visual. And if you notice, um, and there's a sandwich on the background of it because it's called a quotation sandwich, um, the idea is that the quotation is the meat of the sandwich, and we need to provide the bread, the toppings, the condiments, except mayo because mayo's gross. Um, what I like about this diagram is it opens with topic statement or subclaim, development of subclaim, it shows the paragraph developing one main idea, it offers you um, an in-sentence example of how to, you know, how to frame a quotation, um, restatement analysis explication, and while you should use this model for quotation integration, you can extend this how to write a paragraph model to really any paragraph. Uh, because the same principles hold true. Uh, you want to begin with a topic statement or subclaim. Um, of course, before that, you may want to transition from your previous paragraph. And then you want to narrow into one main idea for the paragraph, provide your evidence. Uh, it may be quotation, it may be summary, it may be paraphrase. You want to then analyze that evidence through whatever means is appropriate, and then relate it back to your claim, and then from the claim to the purpose, how it fits into the project, before you begin to transition to your next idea. So. Um, what I'm kind of getting at here is that each sentence within a paragraph serves a purpose, and the more aware of that you are, and the more you attend to that in your own writing, um, generally speaking, um, generally speaking, the stronger your work is going to be. Um, I long those lines um, in terms of course materials. Um, I'm going to supplement our primary work with some style readings. Now, these are optional because, frankly, um, it's an accelerated course for the summer, and the primary purpose of this course is genre, audience, purpose, um, jargon, use style a little bit. Um, so it's, it's, it is optional, but uh, it's really not a lot of reading, and I would really strongly encourage you to read it. Um, it covers things like sentence structure, paragraph structure, principles of strong writing in general, clarity, concision. These are all points that you all brought up in your um, introductions, in your introductory posts. So I know it's stuff that you're aware of, and the the book, the excerpts I'm going to upload are really helpful in showing um, some ways to improve your style, for lack of a, style. It's what it is. It's style. Okay. Um, so I'll post those. Those will be up tomorrow. Uh, I'll be in the office tomorrow scanning and uh, stuff like that. But I would encourage you to review that um, definitely before you edit and proofread this assignment um, because it'll help with stuff like what I'm talking about right now. Um, and while I do want you to be aware of it, it is the secondary purpose of this course to the other stuff that we're covering. So don't, don't like freak out over it. It's important. It matters. And I'm going to push you on it. But the primary purpose is uh, grasping the assignments and the course content. Style is part of it, but it's really secondary. So those are your course materials at this point. You have the assignment sheet, the peer review guidelines, the Pogner reading. Um, I will upload the style stuff tomorrow. So those will all be up. Um, if you have any questions on that, please do let me know. I've gotten a couple emails already. Um, I'm going to post a follow-up lecture to this tomorrow or Friday. Um, if you get the questions into me tomorrow, I can get to it sooner. But anything on the reading or the assignment, um, I'm going to address like this to be even more helpful. Uh, hopefully, helpful. I'll try to be helpful. We'll see. Uh, so let me know. Whatever you want clarification on, I want to provide it. Okay, so there's your update on course materials, the peer review format. Um, so let's get to Pogner, and then we'll get to the writing assignment. 
So the Pogner article, uh, Discourse Communities and Communities of Practice, is, as near as I can tell, one of the clearest distillations of these principles in um, in composition. It, it um, It's good. And I'm sure that it's dense. I know it's dense. But it's better than the other stuff. So uh, what I'm going to focus on here is part two, communities and text and knowledge production, because this is really the, um, this is the heart of Pogner's analysis. And it's really the kind of the part that really is, I think, most important. Um, I will encourage you to read the case studies after it because it really shows you what he's describing. It can be difficult to relate to an abstract or theoretical description of a concept without an example. So don't skip the case studies and then say, I don't understand it. You can read the case studies and say you don't understand it, but you have to read the case studies first. Uh, anyway, communities and text and knowledge production. So the two key concepts here are discourse communities and communities of practice. Now, in both cases, and Pogner lays this out in part one, um, community is really at the heart of what we're doing here. Um, writing, we, we tend to think of writing as this solitary, isolated thing that we do, maybe like locked up in the library, um, headphones in, uh, you know, pulling an all-nighter, or we think of like a medieval monk or something like in a monastery, like scrawling away with a quill on parchment. Um, writing could not be more different from that. And most of you from reading your introductions have been on co-op, have been out there in the working world. You're certainly advanced students, so you know that when you're at work or when you're in school, there's there's always an audience to your work. Always. If you're in a classroom, your audience is your professor, your teacher. That's an audience you're used to writing for. You write to your teacher in one way, and you write to your friends in others. You write to your parents differently. You write to your boss differently. So each of these are different, what we call rhetorical situations that you're entering into, where as a writer, you have distinct needs that you need to meet and distinct functions that you need to carry out. You have a distinct purpose and a distinct way of doing it. So when we think about communities then of writers and readers, what we're talking about are um, groups of people, ultimately, who are communities because of shared discursive practices, the ways that they read and write. And I, I spoke about this a little bit in the first video lecture, but we're going to go a little more um, in depth now. So the key difference between discourse communities and communities of practice is that discourse communities arise for the purpose of producing knowledge to be applied. Uh, another way to say this is that discourse communities are uh, scholarly whereas communities of practice may be scholarly, but they're primarily writing to impact um, the workplace, a professional setting. And the knowledge that communities of practice produce comes primarily from observing uh, practices, human behavior, organizational behavior, what people do. Um, whereas discourse communities may be much, usually are more theoretical or experimental in the source of their knowledge production. So, in, two, in, uh, in section two here, Pogner begins with the story of um, Stanley Fish, a kind of famous literary critic from the 60s through 80s, um, who actually has a fairly high public profile. If you Google Stanley Fish, you might be surprised that you might, like me, you might be surprised people care about Stanley Fish. Um, his, his great experiment was called How, How to Recognize a Poem When You See It. Um, and his great observation was that he was teaching a poetry seminar and he had written the names of six poets on the board who were going to be covered on the next exam. Um, he, it, it was just in a list. He didn't erase the list before the next section came in. And because it was a poetry class and they saw names of poets on the board, um, the students assumed that the list was actually a poem about poets. And they started analyzing it as if it were a poem, even though it was just a list of names to study for an exam. And so Stanley Fish observed this and developed this whole idea called reader response theory, which is that we as readers respond to texts um, when we expect to see them, hence genre. So you see an assignment sheet and you read it one way, whereas if you saw the same words laid out, for instance, like in a comic book, you would read it differently. Um, so 
take that at face value. It is what it is. It's somewhat persuasive. It's mostly interesting. Um, but Pogner uh, cites Fish here for the idea of an interpretive community. And the idea that he borrows from Fish is that interpretive strategies um, are not just for reading, uh, but for writing texts and that uh, communities are defined by practices of interpretation. Um, think about um, symbols more broadly, right? Um, sports team logos, for instance. Um, if you're out of town and you see someone else in a Red Sox hat, maybe you give them a smile or a wave or a high five, um, something like that. And there's other, there's better examples. But the idea is that um, writing here and reading, there are boundaries between groups of people through the ways that they read and write and the symbols and words that they use. Um, obviously, there are some very basic examples of this, like language, like interpretive communities. Um, although I hypothetically have a working knowledge of Spanish, I would never consider myself part of a Spanish-speaking uh, discourse community because my skills are so rudimentary, uh, I probably couldn't get higher than like a B in like a high school Spanish class. So on one level, something like language def uh, defines an interpretive community. Um, being able to understand uh, computer code is another one that I am sadly not a member of. But uh, if you ever hear people talking about coding, you'll hear all kinds of words, jargon, you don't understand, but they interpret it and can relate to it, uh, you know, instantly. You might say that they're fluent in the language of their discourse community, their interpretive community. And so a discourse community is an interpretive community that exists because of discourse, a shared exchange via writing, uh, primarily writing and reading, although it may be speaking and hearing, of, um, of ideas. And specifically, their ideas of um, what Pogner calls special interest groups here, whose main purpose, I'm reading from page five, is to create or produce knowledge in a specific topic or subject area. Um, they possess certain mechanisms and media which allow information to be exchanged and shared by their members, uh, yada, yada, yada. So the production of knowledge, what does that mean? What is knowledge? On some level, knowledge is nothing more than an agreed upon fact that is then cited and generally accepted by an commu interpretive community to be fact. Ergo, um, it is established fact that man landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Unless you think it's a conspiracy theory by the U.S. government, uh, my friend's brother-in-law belongs to that interpretive community, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole here. Um, but again, assuming that this is a fact, of course it it is, um, we can then say that this was the landmark uh, point in United States uh, space exploration, yada, yada, go from there. Um, so the production of knowledge really is about that. And when we're dealing with theoretical, philosophical, or experimental knowledge, um, discourse communities are a way to share that. And it's a way to function so that people with uh, very, very, very precise expertise in a very, very technical or high level uh, field are able to create new knowledge. Knowledge is created. It doesn't come out of thin air. And this is how it happens. So the idea of a discourse community is um, distilled a little more on page six. Pogner gives us, this, gives us the uh, characteristics there of it. Um, so the aims I think I just covered. Now in terms of the participants and members, um, this is interesting because there's no formal membership, right? Um, and sometimes there are self-trained members of discourse communities. So you might have uh, an interest in, uh, I don't know, um, baseball. Yeah, it's probably just me. But you have an interest in baseball, and so you read all about baseball. You read reports, you read books, you read uh, player cards, if those still exist. And what happens is, based on your interest in baseball, um, specifically maybe modern analytics, you can talk about particular statistical categories with other geeks who are into baseball um, that may be older, more casual baseball fans like all of your collective uh, ancestors, fathers, uncles, older siblings even, um, may not necessarily be into. And you kind of create a discourse community there because of a shared 
interest, a common interest, um, but of course it's usually professional or knowledge related in uh, Pogner's case here. So when you're looking at your scholarly writing that you're going to perform a forms of writing analysis on, uh, what you want to consider is what knowledge is being produced, how is the information being exchanged, uh, what barriers of entry are there? For instance, uh, usually in most of your fields, there's going to be a high level of uh, knowledge for like chemistry and biology, math maybe. Um, how does this expertise come about? What kind of training is required? Um, how does one mark their membership? in this discourse community, what practices, usually things like uh, scholarly or professional publications, conference presentations, um, accreditations and certifications, certainly in the health professions, those are a big deal. These are all ways to certify your expertise and that you have the knowledge to become part of this discourse community. Um, and now the distinction between that and communities of practice, uh, let's just flip to the chart on page eight because that's probably easier. So if we're looking at the table on page eight with the community of practice, then unlike the discourse community uh, whose aim is to produce and disseminate knowledge in text and in discourse, the community of practice aims to extend the capabilities of members and exchange knowledge. So their purpose is not theoretical. It's not to create knowledge. It's to actually impact the workplace and the world. Um, Members in this case are actively involved with selecting themselves. Um, doesn't mean you like sign up for the club or anything, but it means you have to come out of your shell and identify as a member of this community of practice. Whereas a, a, you might be like a silent member of a discourse community. For instance, I use baseball as an example. I have never written anything about baseball that has been published. Um, don't know that I've written anything about it anyway. So I'm a member of that discourse community, but I'm not actively doing anything for it. So. I would not necessarily be self-selecting there. Um, basis of cohesion, again, um, passion, commitment, identification with expertise. Again, notice that active role for the community of practice. Um, so in that sense, they're similar but different. And I think the table three on page nine offers a hopeful kind of uh, distillation of how they uh, might play out uh, in the real world so to speak. Um, so the key thing for you to consider here as you're moving to your forms of writing assignment is that you're looking at a discourse community. Community of practice might enter into it as a point of contrast, but we're looking at discourse communities, which means the ways that people read and write and use that reading and writing to structure communications. In the For the sources you will use, this happens through the scholarly writing process. The drafting and submissions of manuscripts, those are done according to guidelines that you can find for the journal. If you Google the title of your journal, you will find um, scholarly writing guidelines that will say things like um, manuscripts must be submitted in double space size 12 times New Roman font, uh, PDF format should be emailed to so-and-so. Um, you'll find things about review process. It will give you, a, a, say, uh, reviewers will be contacted and review may take three to six months. So there's a whole process that they have to go through. And this is how the community kind of comes about. Um, you're going to be looking at what are the practices of this discourse community. And you also want to look at things um, that have to do with the form of the writing. And that's why the title of this is Forms of Writing. What is the form that this writing takes? Um, for instance, what type of citation is used? Endnotes, footnotes, in-text, uh, parenthetical. Um, are there frequent citations or infrequent citations? Are the sentences long or short? Is the language complex or approachable? Uh, are there multiple authors or one author? Do the authors have affiliations with universities, think tanks, uh, scholarly organizations? Uh, are there university affiliations for the publication itself? These are all things that tell us about the discourse community. Um, and the form of the writing. Are there page numbers? How long are the articles? How many words? Um, are there, is there numbers, tables, charts, graphs, visual images? Is it mostly text? These are all different ways of communicating knowledge and of representing information. And what you're going to do is look through and say, what is the form that this writing takes and why does it work the way it does? What you really want to remember here is that you're analyzing the form of the writing, not the content. 
do not summarize the article. Maybe like a three or four sentence summary at the very beginning, but that's it. Do not summarize the article. You want to show how it works. What are the key words? What are the arguments? What's the purpose of it? What kind of information is being distributed? Um, for a lot of you, since so many of you are pharmacy, you might find that uh, it's primarily the community of practice and discourse community boundary is somewhat fluid. Um, that's very true. And that might be a challenge for you all in this. Um, and if, but if that's the case, what I want you to do is embrace that and show how your field might kind of blend those two boundaries and how those two things appear in your sample. Now, if you can find a pure discourse community example, that's great use that. But it's also okay to say these aren't such cut and dry examples here and here's how we can kind of complicate them productively. So don't be afraid to do that um, as well. So there's Pogner a little bit, Discourse Communities and Communities of Practice, and I'm, I'm sure this is a little bit confusing and overwhelming. Just remember, the answers really are in front of you. What you want to do is explain the obvious. Why is something written and why is something published in black and white, for instance? It's easier to read. If there are colors used, where are they used? Probably images. Why do we need colors and images? So on and so forth. So look at what's there and explain what's there. The more obvious you think you're being, probably the more on target you are with this particular assignment. So let's actually take a turn and look at the assignment sheet now a little bit. So if we're looking at the forms of writing assignment sheet, what are the big things to note? Um, thousand words. That's a guideline. Um, I don't see how you can do this in fewer than a thousand words. Um, if you can, I guess great. I don't see that happening though. Um, first and foremost, you're going to be doing a lot of quotation, well, a lot, a good amount of quotation analysis in this project. Uh, you can't analyze the discourse of a discourse community if you don't present the discourse. So, review that quotation integration handout. Okay. Um, what you want to focus on again is the textual and visual features that structure the text. How does it look? Why does it look that way? How does that impact the reading process? And how is this strategy of representing information appropriate for the type of knowledge being presented, the type of information that this discourse community needs to create? How is this working? Uh, in a way, the central question of this assignment is, what is the relationship between the form of the writing and the purpose of the writing? We write for a purpose so we take a certain form, okay? Um, bold sentence. Importantly, this assignment requires you to formulate a thesis-driven analysis of a text as it relates to discourse communities and communities of practice. Your thesis should be something about the form of the writing. Um, in, in, in this article, uh, the authors argue A, B, and C in order to show D, E, and F. This is important because blah, 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 blah. In this discourse community, yada, yada happens. Um, so you need to essentially say, why does this thing work the way it does and how is it helpful? That's your thesis, okay? That's your purpose. I promise you the link is there. Um, the genre conventions part of this, you need to actually think about what am I reading? For most of you, it should be a peer-reviewed scholarly article means it went through the peer review process I spoke about earlier, it means that it's been published, it means that it's probably been cited, and that means that it is therefore knowledge, okay? So what is the relationship between the genre of the scholarly article, uh, or of case study maybe, and knowledge? Citation, citation, sentence structure, jargon, uh, and then, of course, there's also um, there's also, of course, um, values. So, what are the what are the discursive values of your field? Um, in the health sciences, it's usually clarity, concision, and um, ultimately influence on practice. Um, usually, is what it is. Best practices. Uh, I don't. Sometimes that term comes about. Sometimes it's 
not there. But it's usually to influence practice and how further research is done. So what's the relationship between genre, form, and purpose? What you really want to think about here. Uh, let's see. Oh, organization. That's one more thing you might consider. Um, look at your source. Does it look like anything else you've encountered in your field? Hint, a lot of these look like lab reports. What do lab reports follow? Something you probably learned about in 6th, 7th, or 8th grade science class. The scientific method. What's the value of the scientific method? What does it ensure? What does it discourage? C, connections. They're out there, I promise. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we covered Pogner. We covered the assignment. Um, all right, writing process. Uh, this will be the end of the video lecture uh, after this little bit. In terms of the writing process, um, looking at the schedule, you have a couple of key dates here. Uh, the first one is going to be, uh, let's see, by tomorrow, you, that's Thursday the 10th, you need to have read the research guides and go through and um, a bibliography of sources that you might use for your forms of writing assignment. So get some examples. Remember, peer-reviewed sources. Just use the peer review filter on the search engine. It's really easy. Um, I want you to talk about rhetorical situation a little bit there. Who's writing? Why are they writing? How are they writing? What's the purpose and how does it fulfill it? Um, for Monday, you'll have the rough draft. Uh, Tuesday, the peer review will be due. And then Friday, uh, your final. And this is a format that we'll use uh, pretty much on each of these units that we'll do this semester. One note that I do want to offer you on this process. Uh, the process is geared towards um, revision, right? Revision, revisioning the essay. Um, if you look at the peer review guidelines, they take you towards that. There's not a lot of instruction on editing or proofreading. That's your responsibility. Just because that's not a focus of the peer review doesn't mean you're not responsible for crafting your absolute best academic prose. Okay? Um, I read your introductions. I know that each and every one of you is a competent, clear writer. Um, Everybody has strengths and weaknesses, but sloppy writing, stuff where you're missing punctuation, misplaced marks, um, typos, um, needlessly wordy, convoluted sentences, that doesn't fly. I know that you are all capable of doing good writing, and I'm going to give you those style guides tomorrow that you can use to even help improve it more. I'm not expecting you to become uh, Hemingway or something like that. I'm really not. but you need to proofread your work. That's your responsibility. And, you know. So that's all for now. I've gone on far longer than I intended to. Um, I'm sorry about that. There's a lot to cover. Send me any questions. Get them to me. And, um, you know, I'll wait till Friday morning to post a follow-up video to give you more time for questions. But 10 a.m. Friday, I will respond to your questions via video, and we will continue on. So good luck. Enjoy the Pogner reading. Let me know what you need clarification on.